Thanks so much for tuning in. My name is Danielle and I'm the Connections Lead here at LFC. Our prayer today as you watch is that you would be encouraged and challenged to grow in your faith. Enjoy the message. Um, our theme this morning is about embracing the Holy Spirit. How many of you are huggers? Any huggers out there? Um, so I, you know, being a little shorter, um, when a big tall person goes to hug me, I always do the tiptoes because I learned a long time ago, if you don't do that when you're hugging a, a 6'4 person, you get a face full of armpit, you know? And, uh, but there, I mean, I'm not like, like sometimes we go to churches and everybody there's like a hugger or if we go in like the super Italian areas on the East Coast, no disrespect to the Italians, right? But you go to the super Italian areas and everybody's like kissing you on the cheeks and stuff like that. And I'm just, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a little distant hugger, and I'm really not a kisser of strangers. And so um, it's just kind of the way I am. It's like I've always struggled with growing up watching Family Feud with that host that always kissed everybody. I'm like, man, those lips need to be drenched in alcohol or something <laughs> and a wire brush. But um, they're just people are different. We have different postures of response and responsiveness to people. Like there are probably, you probably have a relative that like at Thanksgiving you know when crazy Uncle George comes in, you make sure there's always a piece of furniture between you and him, you know, and you're kind of kind of working the angles like this, you know. Uh, but then there's probably other relatives where your posture of embrace and acceptance is just kind of wide open. Like odds are, unless you have an anomaly, like your, you know, mother was like, friends with Charles Manson or grandmother or something like that was friends of Charles Manson, probably your grandmother is like one of the safe hugs in your life, you know? Anybody thankful you, you had a really great grandma and you're just thankful for that? Like, I don't know about you, if, if I just close my eyes and I get in my nostrils the smell of like hot apple cobbler out of the oven mixed with Aquanet hairspray, it's like, that's like the scented grandma candle, you know? And I can just kind of kind of experience that. And, and for whatever reason, you know, when we would go to my grandmother's house in Southern Illinois, they lived kind of in like near abject poverty, Daryl's been to their house. And you open up their front door, and she always had an open table. Everyone could come in. They didn't have very much, but she just cooked for everybody. She had a special gift on that way. But you open up the door, and she'd be standing there. She always wore an apron when she was at home. And she would go, just come here, hon. And you would just get, <laughs> and you'd get sucked into the vortex. And she was covered in like an inch and a half of tempur foam. And you just, I mean, it was like all the problems melted away when Dorothy Enlow hugged you, you know? Well, likewise, we all have different postures of embrace when it comes to the Holy Spirit. There are some people that they go, well, when they think of the being of God, well, I really trust God the Father, because after all, you know, he's got a throne and whatever. And I really trust Jesus. You know, after all, he became flesh and dwelt among us so we could relate to him, you know, relate humanity to divinity. And, and, and we all have, you know, like a picture of him, right? Aren't you glad when he was on earth that he stopped from healing the sick and preaching the kingdom to sit down so they could take all those pictures of him and paint all those portraits? I'm just so thankful for that. And, uh, but then, you know, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, we don't, we don't share often the same level of embrace and openness that we do towards Jesus. Well, it's significant that uh, the night that Jesus was arrested and betrayed in the Last Supper, uh, Last Supper discourse, somewhere between the prime rib and the cheesecake, although that wouldn't be kosher, somewhere between the prime rib and the strawberry pie, um, Jesus sat down and downloaded to the disciples the last of his recorded lengthy teaching discourses. Um, and the vast majority is on the Holy Spirit. And there's some overriding themes that develop that we're going to look at today. But there's a lot of transfer language going on there. Uh, basically, Jesus is saying, hey, you trusted in me. I'm getting you ready to go away. Take all that trust you've had in me and place it upon the Holy Spirit. He's going to take you the rest of the way. You can hear Jesus vouching for the Holy Spirit, like, hey, you're getting a new neighbor here. I'm leaving. I'm moving away. You're getting a new neighbor, but, but they're good. And you can feel this vouching and this transfer of trust language given. And in that Last Supper discourse, it spans John 14, 15, and 16. And the teaching on the Holy Spirit is the lion's share of chapter 14, a little bit at the end of 15, and then the lion's share of chapter 16. With such a vast amount of Scripture, I don't want to take 
the time today to read the entire portion, but I do want to read the highlights so that you can, together with me, kind of explore some of these major themes. So in honor of the reading of God's Word, would you stand with me to your feet? And we're going to read the Word of God together off the screen. Let it get in your eye sockets and in your coconut. Let it backfeed in your ears. And let's just let the Word of God absorb uh, into our lives. And how many would say the Word of God has changed your life, right? So let's look today and let's read together out loud. You ready? If you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. I am telling you these things now while I am still with you, but when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. But I will send you the Advocate, the Spirit of Truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your word and for your power and for your goodness. And I pray today that your word would not only affect our thinking and our understanding and our ability to answer Bible trivia questions, but your word would affect the way we live, the way we process, the way we see the world around us, our pursuits, our priorities. I choose today, Lord, to submit my proud will and intellect under the authority of your word. Shape me, cause me to think like you, to be like you, to act like you, to respond like you, because your word is finding deep rootedness in my life. Thank you, Lord. And Lord Jesus, following your pattern of ministry where you always taught about the kingdom with one hand, and on the other hand, you healed the sick, I welcome your healing ministry to be at work in this room today. Lord, even during the teaching of the word, I thank you, God, for making Uh, everything in your kingdom easy for us to apprehend. Help us today. I pray, God, even those right now with pain in their bodies will experience the healing grace of Jesus just settling in upon them. Thank you, Lord, for also working and moving in power tonight in the healing service. We thank you for it, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated if you like. I do encourage you to come tonight. Um, I've, you know, I don't mean to brag, but I've arranged just kind of the clout I have, I've arranged for there to be no NFL games tonight. So that shouldn't interfere with your schedule. And uh, so get yourself a QP and come to church, and, and we can pray that God will heal you of the reflux and indigestion that you're dealing with. But, um, but come and give God that opportunity. It's amazing to see what God does in these healing services. Um, just so you know, I don't have any special gift of healing, but I found when you just teach about the kingdom of God and then you get people to pray, the power of God always settles down. Um, the, you are pre-wired as a Christian to encounter God's supernatural ways, which is how the kingdom of God works. And a lot of people just have never opened themselves up to it. And there's not a, like, a, you've got to, you know, some people make everything difficult. You've got to believe that God's going to heal everybody all the time, and you've got to wrap your head in a foil cone on, you know, the mountain during the lightning storm while you're confessing the promises in Hebrew, and then, you, you know, standing on one foot, and they make things so difficult but it's really, we just draw near the Lord and keep our trust in him. And he, he makes these things easy for us. And tonight, uh, as, as we've seen in, you know, many years now, but even in the last several weeks, just tremendous healings coming from the hand of the Lord. 
And we were a couple of weeks ago when we were in Florida, I was getting interrupted while I'm preaching by people yelling, I've just been healed all through the audience because why not, right? Um, you know, and again, it, the Lord receives all the glory for it because it's what he does. He does all the heavy lifting, thankfully. But I encourage you to come back at 6 and uh, bring every sicko you know. How many are sitting by a sicko today? All right. So, so when we think about embracing the Holy Spirit, um, I don't know. If, could, did you pay attention when we were reading that text? Did a lot of that transfer language stuff kind of hit you like, oh, you know? And Jesus isn't saying the Holy Spirit is his replacement, um, as in role and all of those things, but he is teaching us that the same reliance that we had upon Jesus, we are to place upon the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at the five major themes out of this Last Supper discourse that I think will help each one of us because some people honestly are scared to death about the Holy Spirit. They're afraid he's going to hop on you in church and make you run around screaming in a foreign language, you know, and, and doing the funky chicken dance while maybe pee in your pants a little bit or something like that. And a lot of people are afraid that he's here to do something to you. Remember, the Holy Spirit isn't here to take over. He's here to invite us. And it's a very different relationship than a lot of people before they encounter his power uh, or his power in, in, a, in, in growing ways. Um, they kind of have misconceptions, like he's here to zap you and make you do something stupid. I found instead when the Holy Spirit's upon me, I don't look stupid. I look the best I've ever looked. I look more like Jesus in those moments. And so let's look at these five truths today. First of all, the Holy Spirit is divine. Now, when we say divine, that's probably not a word you use in everyday language. Um, there's even like food. That's, what's that stuff that's crunchy white stuff? It's like dried barbasol shaving cream that people make at Christmas divinity, you know? That's not the Holy Spirit, whatever. And, and if you, people go, oh, my divinity's bad. Have you ever had that stuff? You know what I'm talking about? And people are like, oh, mine's better. It just tastes like shaving cream. I'm just going to level with you. I don't find any, I don't experience God when I eat that. But um, when we say divine, we mean the Holy Spirit is God. Did you know the Holy Spirit is called God no less than nine times in the entire Bible? But labels for him are there. Now, as a Christians, we know we serve the one eternal creator God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Um, the Old Testament name for him would be Yahweh. It gets mistranslated before they understood uh, Hebrew value usage as Jehovah. But it's, call him Jehovah, he's been called worse, that's fine. But Yahweh would be the most accurate pronunciation for his covenant name. Um, um, and so we know we worship the one eternal creator God. How many worship the one creator God of heaven and earth, right? The God of the Bible. But then the second fact there is that even though he is one being, he has forever revealed himself in the three distinct persons within the one being of God, God the Father, or God the Son and Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. And so a lot of people struggle with this because they, you know, they're trying to, trying to fix all, all this information in their brain and trying to make nice little uh, categories and people come up with all these metaphors that's never work because it's just a surpassing mystery. But you'll notice here in the Gospel of John and in the passages, passages we read that it's replete with Godhead, Trinity language. In fact, indeed, the book of John is Trinity, Godhead central in the Bible. I mean, it's impossible to get out of reading the, the gospel from the beloved disciple John without understanding uh, some of the, the interaction of God. You see it here. I, Jesus, will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Speaking of the Spirit, um, the Father sends the advocate, the Spirit, as my, Jesus' is representative. But let's just hone in on, on that top scripture on the words, another advocate, for a moment. So you do not need to understand Koine Greek, which the New Testament was written in. Remember, the Bible is not an English book. It's a foreign language book that's been translated into English. Um, and we have lots of great English translations, very, there's really great translations in English, really meaningful. But sometimes you kind of miss some of the nuances. So, because Koine Greek is very, very specific. So you have um, another advocate. So in Greek, basically, you have two words for other or another, and they have a different nuance. You have heteros, which means another of an entirely different kind. That word, like another heteros, would be like, um, and they began to speak with another tongue. That would be another of a different kind language than they'd ever learned before. It's totally different than some. But then you have this one. This another is allos. It's another of an identical kind. Here is a brown church chair. 
Here is Aulos and another of the same kind, another brown chair. They're identical, another one of the same kind. And then you have the word advocate. Um, like I was raised in church and, and, and mostly King James Version was used, which is a, a wonderful version. Um, and the word here is another comforter. You ever heard that one before? Some texts say counselor, which is a pretty good translation. Some texts say helper, which is a little squishy. And then some translations say friend, which is just not friend. It's not the word. Um, and it's kind of ultimately squishy. But when you think of comforter, what do you think of right off the bat? You think of that big warm blanket, and that's kind of not the way we use that word now. I believe presently in English, this translation advocate would be the clearest, uh, best single word translation with modern word usage that is probably there in any version. But the word there for advocate is parakletos or paraclete, and the idea there is the prefix para, like parallel lines, alongside, and then the root word is a verb uh, but it's used here in a noun form, but it's kaleo, to, to call or summon for help and assistance. You know, it's the red phone. It's, you know, in case of emergency, break glass. It's 911. But it's also used in a mentor relationship. I don't know what to do. So you call the person that you would trust their advice in that specific area. Jesus says, I am going to send you, I'm going to give you another one just like me, parakletos. Like, I've stood with you, I've walked with you for these three years, I've taught you about the kingdom of God, I've shown you healing the sick and preaching the kingdom and raising the dead and all that, I've shown you the principles of the kingdom, taught you about, I've been the, your alongside one, I'm getting ready to go, and I'm going to send you another one just like me that you can call for help. And then if you look at this next one, there are 16 different labels for the Holy Spirit that reveal his deity, his divinity in the Bible. 16 different titles for the Spirit, total major ones in the Scripture, and they're kind of in chronological order. Just the first time that moniker is used, you can see them, uh, eight of them here. A couple of them um, notable, for, of course, the first one, Genesis 1, 2, second verse of the Bible, the Spirit of or proceeding or coming from God. And then if you look at, um, I like the bottom one too, Acts 16, 7, the spirit of Jesus. He's even identified more specifically. And then go to the next one, please. You know, notice uh, the, the final eight here. Um, and so we've got, I love uh, the one and only spirit, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, um, his spirit, Ephesians 3. Um, but look at the bottom one there, the sevenfold spirit. People get all wonky and wacky. Like, honestly, uh, you know, from an exegetical basis of studying Scripture, like if someone ever goes crazy into, like, numerology on stuff like that, let that be like a, whoa, they're going off the deep end on this. Um, this is not like the Holy Spirit has seven faces or seven facets. Um, you can't read into that with conjecture. It is simply to say he is entire and complete, lacking nothing. He is not only holy, H-O-L-Y, but he is also whole, W-H-O-L-E, complete, entire, lacking nothing. And, and very, very significant that both, you know, the Bible begins in Genesis 1-2 with the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters, and the Bible ends in the last three verses of Revelation with the Spirit in unison with the bride of Christ saying, come, Lord Jesus. I mean, his work is replete there. The Holy Spirit is God's personal spirit. And then secondly, not only is the Holy Spirit divine, the Holy Spirit is trustworthy. This is where a lot of that transfer language comes into play. So Jesus is basically vouching for the Holy Spirit. If you trust me, trust the Holy Spirit. He's going to take you the rest of the way. Listen to some of this language that he uses here. He, the Spirit, will teach you what? Everything. Right? And will remind you of everything I, Jesus, has told you. Then he goes on to say, I'm going to send you the advocate, the spirit of what? Truth. truth. John earlier records Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So you see the continuing ministry of the spirit. And then and he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about whom? All about Jesus. The Holy Spirit is entirely trustworthy. Sometimes people go, well, I don't know. I've heard, I saw on YouTube, somebody said it was a move of the Holy Spirit, and they were biting the heads off of chickens and, you know, running around in their underwear or whatever it is. And I mean, I'm being facetious, hopefully. But a lot of people take the craziest human behavior that's blamed on the Holy Spirit and just say, oh, that must be the Holy Spirit then. 
we don't take the world around us to judge what is God. Instead, we take the Bible to judge what is the Lord and what belongs to him. And there are a lot of people that have very uneasy fears about the Holy Spirit that are not rested in the Scripture. They're rested on their experience or on what someone else has said. How many of you know, even if we trust this person to be some great Bible teacher or great theologian, if what they're teaching in a certain area doesn't line up with the Word of God, we go, that's wrong. And the Word of God is always right. The Holy Spirit is trustworthy. Jesus is saying, if you trust me, take that trust and place it on the Holy Spirit because he is entirely trustworthy. He's not saying don't trust Jesus anymore. and take the, He's saying take the same level of trust you've had for Jesus and let that same level of trust be upon the Holy Spirit. Number three, the Holy Spirit is not only trustworthy, but he's recognizable. And I love this one. Um, a lot of people, because, again, you, we struggle and, you know, we can get a picture of Jesus and we feel like we can relate to him. We've all had a father, good, bad, present, absent. You know, we, we understand fatherhood. But we just struggle in relating to the Holy Spirit. He made that one-time physical appearance like a dove. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit is not a dove. But, you know, we, we have that association with him. And, and then other than that, he, you know, we don't know what to do with him. But... You can recognize him because from the moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you. Oodles of scripture on this. Romans 8, 9 is a key text there. But um, Corinthian temple text, many others. But it worked its way into most of, of Paul's 13 letters that the Holy Spirit lives in you from when you were saved. But a lot of people, they go, well, the Holy Spirit's lived inside of me, but I'm afraid he's going to do something weird to me. It's kind of... Contradiction, isn't it? Think about this for a moment. How many of you uh, today during our awesome season of worship, you sensed God's presence? You became aware. It wasn't through your normal outward senses. You didn't see, hear, physically feel, you know, um, taste. But in your inner being, you began to become aware God is here. God's presence is here, right? What you were sensing was the Holy Spirit's presence inside of you being stirred up or you becoming more, maybe more recalibrated to become sensitive to the already present presence of God in corporate worship. You are sensing the Holy Spirit inside of you at work validating what's going on. Jesus put it this way. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world, the lost, cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him, but you do because he lives with you now and later will be in you. This promise is given at the feathered edges of the Old and New Covenant. Jesus um, was there teaching the kingdom, doing miracles. Later on, he would be arrested, crucified, raised again on the third day. So this is right at that edge, the end of the Old Covenant, the beginning of the New. And in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit did not live inside of the people of God. He dwelt tangibly um, over the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil. What, when Jesus said, it is finished, what happened? Remember that he tore that veil in two, abolishing the need for a physical temple? Did you know now you, your body, is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Right? So this is prophesied right at the edge, right before Jesus died and rose again. The veil hadn't been torn yet. But now when you and I are saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. He goes, the world doesn't recognize him, but you can even someone still in an Old Testament status of righteousness with God could recognize the Holy Spirit's presence. How much more now you and I in this new and better covenant. So now when the Holy Spirit's at work, there's this resonance, this authenticity check that goes on. They go, oh, yeah. It's like a, a recaptcha online, you know. Uh, click all the fire hydrants, you know. You go, oh, yeah, that's the Holy Spirit at work. I recognize him. When you sense his presence today, you didn't go, hey, wait a minute, who is this? Can I see some ID, please? You know, you didn't check your Ring doorbell app, you know, on your spirit to make sure you could identify the spirit. You just resonated with him. And that's really important. God has given you a detection system, a recognition system built in, hardwired in from the Holy Spirit. Not only is he recognizable, number four, he is revelatory. He reveals and some people are scared of this word because they just read into it, oh, he's going to give you some revelation outside of the Bible. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. 
the Holy Spirit, his revelation ministry helps accentuate something from the Bible or bring it to our awareness, as the text previously says. Jesus says, there's so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. You're not ready for it, perhaps. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He's not going to guide you into error. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. We'll get to that in a minute. He will tell you about the future. Every verb about the Spirit's ministry in this Last Supper discourse is revelatory. Teach, lead, guide, direct, reveal, make known. It's what he does. Even before you're saved, he was the one, John 16, 8, we read it earlier. He reveals to you that you have sinned. How many of you have sinned? Every Michigan fan needs to raise their hand, all right? Okay, <laughs> that you have sinned, especially Pastor Christian, you have sinned that God is righteous. How many believe God is entirely righteous? These are not facts that come about by doing a trigonometry problem. They come about by revelation of the Holy Spirit in your life. Before you were saved, you were receiving revelation from the Spirit. Then when you're saved, he comes to live inside of you. He makes known the presence of Jesus. He leads and guides and affirms that you belong to God. And after all, the Bible and the Holy Spirit are not in conflict. Peter says the Holy Spirit wrote the Bible, 2 Peter 1.21, as he moved upon holy men of old. And so there's like no conflict. A lot of people think the Holy Spirit's some antagonist where sometimes he's for you, but most of the time he's there. To, it's not that way at all. In fact, we'll see in just a moment how this works. But revelation, he says he'll tell you about the future. Think about on the small scale, how many of you can honestly think of a time, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but you can think of a time when the Holy Spirit has led and guided you, helped you make a, a God decision in your life, you know? You know what that's like on the small scale, probably many more times than you can remember. Most of us have forgotten more small revelation help from the Holy Spirit than we can remember. But on the macro scale, on the big scale, probably none of you have been to heaven. Occasionally, God favors a person and brings them to heaven, lets them walk around and take pictures and notes, and then they come back down and write a best-selling, I've been to heaven, but I've been kicked out book. And, uh, and so... Very, uh, very subtle. But most of us haven't been there. I've not been there. Um, but Lima, for example, is a lot like heaven, isn't it? And so, um, but we, we've, we've, we haven't been there. Yet. But inside, how many of you honestly know you just have this interior longing and desire to be in God's preferred future, you know? You have, even on the big things he's revealed, that is revelation in your heart and life that comes alive. Finally, the Holy Spirit is Jesus-focused, and this makes him and his, the pursuit of his presence and work the safest of all. In fact, some people think like whenever you talk about the Holy Spirit that it's displacing Jesus, but that's because they don't theologically understand the Holy Spirit's work. The Holy Spirit is like a big red blinking neon arrow always taking you deeper into the things of Jesus pointing you to Jesus in a greater way. Jesus put it this way, he, the Spirit, will bring me Jesus' glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. Now, go back one slide, please. Look at the third line. He will not speak, the Spirit will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. Didn't, when you read that, didn't you go, wait a minute, who's he repeating? Didn't that come to your mind? Now, go to the next slide. Jesus says, he will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. Me, Jesus. The Holy Spirit does not speak on his own initiative. He speaks only what Jesus tells him to speak. Now think about this for a moment. How many have ever felt um, like you want, you've heard Jesus speak to you in some way? Guide, lead, help? You heard his voice through the ministry of the Spirit. Anytime you've ever heard the Holy Spirit's guidance, lead, help, direction in your life, you've actually been hearing not what he came up with out of his own initiative, the scripture says, but instead the things Jesus said, hey, tell it. And the Holy Spirit communicates that to you now because he lives inside of you. Uh, or as Paul said, his spirit, capital S, joins with our spirit, lowercase s. We experience that communication connection, that familial connection that takes place um, to affirm that we belong to God, Romans 8 says. We experience that. The Holy Spirit is Jesus-focused. He will think about this for a moment. And again, this is probably an oversimplification. But if you look at this, um, the, my favorite verse in the Bible, John uh, 16, 15, um, says, everything the Father has is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and will make it known to you. 
And in that verse, it's interesting because you kind of can see that. Jesus, you see, you know, and again, this is inadequate theologically, but if you think of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and then you and I in the end, Jesus says everything the Father has is mine, so the Father hands Jesus something. And that's why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine. You see Jesus handing it to the Holy Spirit and making it known to you. You see, the Holy Spirit is the communication system. A lot of people, they want to experience all that God has, but they want to remove the Holy Spirit out of the link. And it's not the way it works at all. You cannot fulfill the will of God without being open to the Holy Spirit in your life. There's no caution. There's no fear. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus go, well, you know, tolerate the Holy Spirit. But he's basically a prankster, you know. He doesn't say that. Oh, hey, look out. He might get you to sign up for multi-level marketing essential oils or whatever. He doesn't do that. He's, he's not there. He's not trying to mitigate his friends list for his own personal benefit, you know. He's only there to take the things that are Christ and make it known to you. And sometimes this revelation happens in ways in our lives that really challenges us because we don't understand everything, and, but he does. And very often, because the way the kingdom of God works with faith and trust in the Lord, um, whenever I say faith and trust, I always think end pixie dust, but that's not in the Bible. But, um, but because the kingdom of God works in that faith trust um, uh, economy, we don't understand everything. It's intentionally designed to be that way, that we would just trust in him. And sometimes his revealing ways really lead us out of our comfort zone. Now, that's not to say if something is weird and wacky, it is therefore, or out of your comfort zone, it's therefore the Holy Spirit. But sometimes his leading really tries us in that way. Like the beginning of this last year, uh, our first, first services in early January were in the Cherokee Reservation outside in the eastern, southeastern Oklahoma near Muskogee. And... Um, and at the end of the service, we did a healing service like we'll do tonight at the end of that conference, and there a bunch of healings and stuff. And at the end, there's about 16 people that came up to testify with, I came in this way, and now it's this way. I once was blind, and now I see there's actually two blind people that were healed. So great stuff going on. So I'm going down the row with a microphone going, what happened to you, you know, as they're sharing their testimony. And from the very first person, I began to wrestle with the Holy Spirit prompting me. If you're familiar with some of those gifts of the Holy Spirit, Pastor Darrell mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11, it would probably be like a little word of knowledge where he just gives you a little, a little data, usually a noun or something, and, and you kind of pray about it, and he helps you to know what you're to do about it. And that's what I began to write. One word, and it didn't make any sense. I had no context, extraordinarily vague, like abnormally vague. And as I'm going down the line interviewing people, I'm trying to listen to their story and stay connected, but I'm also praying, and I'm like, Lord, because sometimes if you pray, you can get some clarity. I'm like, Lord, I'm drawing near to you. What, do you have anything else? And I was getting desperate as I was running out of people to interview because I knew then at the end, the pastor was going to come forward and dismiss everyone, and I could feel the window of opportunity to obey the Lord closing, but in my inner being, I just wanted to understand more, Right? And I'm like, oh, Jesus, can I have more Pat? Can I buy a vowel? You know, I'm just looking for any kind of a clue. And when the last testimony happened, it was over with. People were rejoicing together. I saw the pastor stand up from over about where you're sitting and walk towards me. And I knew I had like 12 seconds to obey. So I go, hey, while pastor is coming, how many of you would cut me some slack to be wrong? I'm trying to, you know, stretch out the, the safety net around it, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I've been wrestling with this. It doesn't make any sense to me. But I just feel like the Lord wants me to say this one word out loud in the microphone. I don't have any application for it. Here it is. <clears throat> Yellow. And that was their response. Nervous laughter and silence. The pastor immediately was there, took the mic, and goes, well, whatever. We'll just leave that one with the Lord. All right, God bless you. See you next week. He hits me in the arm. He goes, yellow. I know what that's like to try to wrestle with something that God's trying to get you to say and do, and you don't have any, you know, I get it. But that one was weird. And I go, I'm sorry, pastor. You get any problems, just send them to me. You know, I'll, I'll own it. So we're talking to people, and as the crowd is clearing out, we thought the sanctuary was empty. We hit the back doors together to go in the lobby where there's still a few people. And all of a sudden, a head popped up from the seating section. They had three seating sections in the big middle area. And a lady goes, hey, can I talk to you guys? And by that point, we had already kind of taken the first step over the, the threshold. So she met us in the lobby. She said, I'm sorry, I was picking up our mess in this church. And she said, well, first of all, I want to apologize that my daughter was so disruptive tonight. She was inconsolable, was her word. And I didn't notice. I said, honestly, I didn't notice anything. And she goes, well, I'm glad. But, well, and then she kind of began to choke up. She's 
really, really has severe autism. And she said, in fact, she's, um, she's verbal and vocal. She makes sounds, vocalizes, but she's non-language. And tonight, for whatever reason, she was just fit to be tied. We couldn't console her. We brought her here to receive prayer. And about halfway through the teaching time, my husband looked at me and said, this is not fair to our little Micaiah. Uh, she's throwing stuff everywhere. She said, that's what I was picking up underneath all the theater seats, picking up all the stuff. And she said, she just was just inconsolable. And so he leaned over to me and said, honey, we know there's no distance in prayer. I'm going to go home right now, take her home with me, and I'll turn on this live stream. And then you and your mom who's sitting there beside you, you agree in prayer. We can get on the phone if you want and pray at that prayer time. But just let Micaiah be comfortable. There's no sense in, in making her uncomfortable like this. No distance in prayer. We'll believe God. She said, yeah, I know you're right. But she said as, as soon as he left, I began to sulk a little bit. And she said, then when we had the healing prayer time, my mom and I, we prayed and agreed in prayer for her. And we've always felt a strong promise of, of healing for her, not only for, obviously from the word of God, but kind of that inner knowing that God's going to do this and that he gives. And she said, but then when the people began to give their testimonies, she said, it really began to rip my heart out. She's like, oh, that could have been McKay up there tonight. All oh, that one, you know. And she said, I began to really sulk. And her word was, I began to get acidic towards God. How many of you know he already knows what you're thinking anyway, you know? A lot of people are afraid to be honest. Well, it's, you know, you read the Jonah narrative, you know, he knows anyway. And you might as well obey him up front or else you end up on a strange beach covered in gumbo, right? And so, so uh, he, he uh, or she, she said, you know, as, as the testimonies were going, I began to really talk back to God and ever increasingly, you know, kind of harsh. She said, honestly, I wasn't, I wasn't very nice. But it was her honest heart. It was like reading a psalm of lament. Where are you, God, in all of this? You know, kind of a thing. A righteous, a righteous position to be in, and as long as you stay centered on the Lord. And she said, I put my forearm on the theater seat in front of me, and I, my forehead dropped there, and I just began to sulk. And hearing these testimonies, I was celebrating for the person, but she said, I began to say, God, that could have been her. And she said, as it went down the line, I was like, God, do you even care about my daughter? Do you even know her? Do you even know her name? And by the last person, she said at the very end, she said, God, I don't think you even love her. You don't even know anything about You don't even know what her favorite color is. Yellow immediately came over the PA system. She just began to break and cry. I had no idea what God is doing. I don't, you know, I'm like you, just trying to, trying to obey Jesus. But even the timing is just extraordinary with the Lord. And she began to weep, and she opened up her purse, and what she had been picking up was a handfuls, a hundred or more of those little yellow counting bears, if you've ever taught elementary math, all over the floor, because she said yellow is the only consistent positive stimulus that my daughter responds to, not even human touch. She just, for whatever reason, is just fires up about anything yellow. And she said, I know God's going to heal my daughter. We've got the promises in the word, and we have the promise inside, a special gift of faith. We know he's going to do it. But she said, I want you to pray for her. And she handed me one of those yellow counting bears, which I, I have. And, and just kind of as a side note, would you pray for Micaiah? Would you remember her in prayer? And, and even on the bigger scale, from that moment now for over a year, I've been praying, God, would you just send a, a wholesale healing into our churches all across America and around the world of kids with learning disabilities? Wouldn't that be just the most amazing things to have, have kids awakening from, uh, from those difficulties and even adults too? I mean, why not? Anything's possible with God. But I share all that to say that the Holy Spirit is not here to take you into embarrassment. He's here to take us into wholeness and take us into Jesus. Thanks again for joining us. If you would like to connect with us, text the word CONNECT to 419-495-6802. Lastly, be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on next week's message.